So we'll move on to our keynote presented by Torsten Heffler, who is the professor of computer science at ETH Zurich. He'll be presenting spin-based in-network computing from sparse reductions to risk five. Torsten, how are you? So yeah, thanks everybody for, uh, for being here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me, um, especially uh, Hussein and, and Sydney. Um, so I'm Torsten from ETH Zurich. Uh, I'm uh, leading the Scalable Parallel Computing Lab. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the spin-based in-network computing and uh, what has been happening in the, in the last, uh, I would say, one to two years in that project. So the project is actually a pretty a large project going on since uh, more than five years now with lots of industry support and lots of people working on it. So you can see a, a subset of the people here. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the philosophy and, and what, it's, uh, what it is and what it's going to be and, and where it's going to show up. So let's get started. So first, I want to give a little bit of the historic background of high-performance computing uh, networking interfaces. And this is quite important to focus on high-performance computing because in the data center world, uh, pretty much everything has been Ethernet. But high-performance computing is a field that is very open to, I would say, experimentation, as we can see with the adoption of InfiniBand, with, which at the end led to, uh, led to this workshop here and, and many, many other interesting advances and, and RDMA and all of these things. So let me just summarize this briefly from the uh, high-performance networking perspective. Of course, everything started with Ethernet in the, in the 80s uh, with the famous, um, the, the, the famous sheet of paper that outlined the ethereal network. Um, and there we used sockets as a programming interface. Then quickly after came the scalable coherent uh, interface. That was when I started. Um, talking about network or looking into a network, but unfortunately, uh, scalable coherent uh, that doesn't really go together. Uh, so it's either scalable or coherent, I would say today. But but in the in the good old days, uh, that was not absolutely clear. Um, then people were working on fast messages, so that kind of replaced um, SCI. So going from a memory centric framework to a memory access centric communication to message based communication. That was a very important step. And it's essentially they went to active message based communication. Uh, so then we had the good old Mirinet um, introducing operating system bypass in, in about the 2000s. Then we had Quadrix, which was the first one to introduce protocol offloading, um, all in the message based um, uh, context. Um, then we had the virtual interface architecture going to zero copy. And this was the first idea where we were going back to a memory based, but this time not coherent, but non-coherent. Um, and this actually gave rise to, to various network architectures like Cray Gemini. And then with InfiniBand, um, that kind of zero copy uh, idea approach from VIA was uh, framed as, uh, as remote direct memory access, which is what, remote, uh, what remains today. So the idea here is that we have non-coherent access to remote memory, or in, in other words, we have remote copy semantics. Uh, this is what RDMA is about. So really like local DMA, it's just that you DMA over the network. And of course, uh, we all know this. I just wanted to uh, summarize this. And then the Open Fabrics Alliance was uh, pushing the standardization. Then we have portals for kind of an extension over this RDMA where they enable triggered operations such that you could actually um, um, implement more complex uh, DMA oper uh, remote DMA operations as chained um, or so-called triggered operations. And then the fabrics. And today, <laughs> left, right, up and down, we have uh, smart NICs, DPUs, IPUs, NPUs, XPUs. I don't know what kind of PU is going to show up next week, but, but I'm sure somebody will come up with a new term. So data processing unit, infrastructure processing unit, network processing unit. And again, I'm sure there will be more. And now the question is, how do we go forward from here? So what is the researchy vision? So I'm, I'm a researcher and, and I want to establish a roadmap of where we should go with these various uh, SmartNIC architectures. And here the, the question is, well, what does exist today in the SmartNIC world? Well, we have basically three different forms of uh, three different classes of SmartNICs. Um, one is where we have full ARM cores with basically a full operating system, but not really in the packet uh, path. So so-called off-path NICs. An example is Mellanox's Bluefield, or, or Broadcom's uh, various um, uh, smart NICs. Then we have um, flow processors that are in the path by definition somewhat. And uh, these flow processors are basically 
processing, uh, capable of processing every single packet. Well, these cores here are, are going to have a hard time if you plug them uh, to a 400G NIC, let's say. They, they're not really capable of processing all packets, at least not uh, investigating all data in all packets. So they can do header processing for sure. And then we have flow, flow processors that are uh, faster but have very limited uh, processing capability, very limited flexibility. So this is very far away from general purpose. They usually can rewrite headers and things like this. And then we have specialized solutions, which are mostly FPGAs, very limited productivity and limited silicon efficiency. But Microsoft has actually deployed a pretty large uh, collection of those guys. And, and these were uh, either from Xilinx or from Intel. Oh, now I should say AMD, in fact, and, and, and Intel. So both of these FPGA companies have been acquired by large processor company, companies, which already tells you that there is some uh, future for this technology and, and so probably big markets coming. But the question is, where are we going here in this uh, smart NIC area? So let me give you a little bit of an overview of how uh, NICs process data. And again, this is probably pretty obvious for most of you, but let me just summarize it for the common terminology. So we have packets coming in into an RDMA network interface card. The RDMA network interface card does RDMA processing through a DMA unit and then uh, pushes the data into uh, memory, into main memory DRAM at the host. Then the host, in order to process this data, actually reads it through its own memory hierarchy, processes it in the, in the registers, of course, and then writes it back or just uh, consumes it. So that's kind of the, the high level picture. But what does this actually mean if you put this in context of an NVIDIA Connect X7 card, which is a 400G, uh, up to 400G uh, uh, smart NIC, or not really smart, uh, in the base configuration, but there are probably smart NIC configurations as well. But now we have to receive one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds at 400G in the worst case, if you have small packets. Um, at 800G, where the ethernet spec uh, is, is, exists and we could actually, some companies are announcing products, um, we get one packet every 0 0.6 nanoseconds. So now if you think about this, if you're thinking about the latencies down here, you see that there is a little bit of a disparity. And of course, uh, we can pipeline these, uh, these packets. So that doesn't mean that we have to wait 250 nanoseconds for one packet to be processed if we have lots of them, which is typically the case if you do 400 or 800G networking. Um, then the pipelining will be much friendlier. But still, this processing complex here with that uh, limited um, with these limited latencies as, as well as limited bandwidth may not be the most efficient way to process packets. Um, however, the RDMA network card is actually built to process these kinds of packet streams. It has been constructed to process one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds, which you can see in the extremely impressive message rates uh, that um, the NVIDIA cards today get. I mean, this is actually ex extremely impressive. Um, and so here in this NIC, we have all the infrastructure for doing extremely high throughput packet processing, which is not possible in, in today's CPUs. Okay, so, but how can we now use this infrastructure in the RDMA NIC to do more than just RDMA? Because RDMA is a very simple interface. As I mentioned, it's just a copy interface. I can just copy messages from, a to, from host A to host B and not do anything else. I always have to process these messages, uh, as you remember here, on the CPU. Okay, so now let's look a little bit more into details of how acceleration on the NIC actually, uh, how acceleration actually works in general. So as we know from NVIDIA, um, there is a wonderful story for compute acceleration. So there are many interfaces like OpenGL, DirectX. Uh, these were first focused on simple graphics acceleration. And then later came the uh, somewhat of a generalization started with uh, Brooks++, later leading into CUDA and many other um, similar interfaces such as OpenCL and OpenMP that were then taking over and kind of liberating the graphics processing cards, uh, graphics processing units to be used for other things, giving it the somewhat paradoxical name of general purpose graphics processing unit, which, which never made any sense to me. Um, but it's, it kind of comes from the history. It used to be a graphics processing unit and now it's a general purpose unit. So meaning that I can process, uh, program those with more general purpose languages. In network acceleration today, we are at a very, very similar place. So we have P4 and eBPF as very specialized models for packet processing, very much like OpenGL and DirectX 11. And now the question is, what do we do about this generalization? Can we have a similar success story in networking? And we claim yes. And our solution to this is the spin programming model that I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes in detail based on a RISC-V architecture. But the RISC-V architecture is really a detail 
mainly uh, we, we mainly chose it because it's easily available uh, free of charge and, and we can distribute our RTL code to everybody and, and uh, companies can actually build it and without any IP issues. So that is our uh, solution. And that is what we call streaming processing in the network. Okay, the idea is the high level idea is fully programmable packet handlers, very much like a CUDA for the network card. So how does it work in the abstract machine model? It's relatively simple. I mean, a network card, as we see here in this uh, green box, has a fast shared memory buffer, a packet input buffer. I mean, every network card has that. <laughs> a network card has an incoming link and a packet scheduler. Every network card has that as well. But now what we add is so-called header uh, handler processing units. So these processing units is kind of a small, well, actually large uh, processor array of relatively small processors in our design, but lots of them. And then we have the usual DMA unit, which must be there for RDMA anyway. This DMA unit reads and writes from the main memory that is located at the CPU. So this is our old DRAM over here. Then the CPU itself is not doing packet processing anymore, but the CPU itself instead uploads handlers very much like GPU kernels into the network card and actually manages the memory on the network card very much like you would do with CUDA memcopy and all those CUDA commands in the GPU kernel. Uh, but the NIC is now your new GPU and the processing task is not matrix multiplication like typically on GPUs, um, but actually um, packet processing, but otherwise the model is very much the same. And now just to animate this a little bit, what's, what's happening, packets are coming in into this packet buffer. They're scheduled to the handler processing units. They're processed there. They change their shape, of course. They may take uh, different amounts of time for processing. And then they're deposited in a processed way into the CPU memory. So for example, this NIC could run a full TCP or quick stack. It can be configured by the CPU to be specific to a, one application, like let's say YouTube, which has different parameters as my web browser for showing videos, or even Zoom could install a handler. Very much like Zoom right now runs on my GPU, Zoom would run a packet processing handler on my NIC in, I would say, five to 10 years. Um, okay, so about this programming interface, the idea is relatively simple. We have a message-based programming interface. Each message has, uh, consists of multiple packets. Each packet has a header packet, that's typically the first packet, and a tail packet, that's typically the last packet. The packet scheduler then schedules these different packet types to the different handlers. We have three different types of handlers for stream processing in the network. Um, we have a header handler, we have a payload handler. The header handler processes the header packet. The payload handler processes every single payload packet. And then there is a completion handler, which is invoked upon final, the final packet. You can uh, install those handlers, again, very much like CUDA, um, in, in a connection. So instead of just establishing a TCP connection with the, uh, with the next host, you would establish a TCP connection, and you would specify these processing handlers. And then the operating system would download them like a CUDA kernel um, to the network card. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of, a, of an abstract overview, how, would, how does this compare to RDMA? So RDMA is, as I mentioned, we have an initiator and a target. We, we, we send a message as, uh, in this case, three packets. These three packets travel from the CPU to the uh, NIC, to the other NIC on the other side into main memory, and then they're triggered. Then let's say it's a ping pong. Then the CPU gets a completion event. And after the completion event, the CPU is sending those back. Um, for streaming processing in the network, you would actually do the same thing at the initiator, but at the target, the code is running right on the NIC. So it's not even touching the DRAM at the destination and will be punked back immediately. And you already saw that it's somewhat of a pipeline model such that you can have um, multiple packets at different stages in the network, which is also quite nice. So now to give you a little bit of an overview um, of the talk. So this was just the introduction. What has been about? What is, what is the vision? Where are we going with this project? And now I want to give you a little bit of um, uh, some use cases, what you can use this for, you're probably curious, and what is this packet processing good for? Then I will give you an overview of the hardware implementation that we have currently, it's fully open source. If you're a, a NIC vendor, you can use it yourself. If you're a research group, you can download Conundrum and you can actually run it there. Very soon we will have a supported version of this as well. Um, Conundrum is an FPGA NIC implementation. And then at the end, I will talk about in-network reductions where, the, where we carry the idea into switches um, very much uh, like the, the sharp protocol of, of Mellanox, uh, sorry, NVIDIA, and, uh, but, but more flexible in the sense that we have these full programmability also in the switch, um, very much with the same uh, model. So 
the use cases for in-network compute, we have a lot of those. And I just want to focus on some. So we have network accelerated data types. We have a full file system implementation. We have a Zookeeper implementation that we call Zoo Spinner, in case you're a, a data center person. Uh, we have an erasure coding implementation. We do quantization uh, for deep neural networks. We do packet classification, and we actually have also an implementation of serverless, um, the hosting side of serverless, uh, in case you're a, a data center provider. Um, I just want to show um, the best example, I think, is, is uh, MPI data types, where we have arbitrary transformations of packets to memory locations. So you have to imagine that this packet that sits here at the source CPU wants to be, um, uh, contains a lot of logical uh, memory regions that need to be spread into the destination memory, and the description of those memory regions is quite complex, meaning that complex description cannot be expressed as scatter gather lists, or, or could be, but in most cases it cannot be expressed as scatter gather lists, but it can be expressed as MPI data types. By the way, MPI data types allow you to express any um, uh, scatter gather list, while scatter gather lists typically have a limited number of entries. Um, so that's the huge difference because they can define it algorithmically. So what happens in the default RDMA implementation is you send these packets to the input buffer of the MPI library. The MPI library then reads those on the CPU, copies those into the destination memory location. So this is what MPI-CH, MVAPIC, and, and pretty much every MPI implementation does today for complex data types. Um, so we see the performance here, completion time, the higher the verse, and here we see uh, the, the block size um, of, of a particular um, data type, where we, which, which you can read here what it does. Um, so it's, it's really a simple strided data type. But the stride is, uh, contains too many blocks to be expressed in, um, in a scatter gather list. So now we have the spin case. And spin, as you can imagine now, does the whole processing on the NIC and immediately puts it into destination memory. You see the data is not hitting the input buffer and is being read again. So we are expecting about a 3x speed up because we are turning three reads and writes, write transactions on our memory into a single read, set of read and write transactions on our memory. What we are actually seeing is slightly larger. So we get a 3.8x speed up. Um, because of course the memory has additional uh, contention overhead when it reads and writes these things. Um, so you can see this handler is also super simple. It's only 54 instructions. So remember this number. This will be important later. Uh, the number of instructions plays a role when it comes to very high speed packet processing. Um, so now we have more use cases for more data types that come from real applications. I want to focus on just one here, SW4 Lite um, from a benchmark suite. Um, from a DOE benchmark suite. I just want to focus on one particular send call in that SW light. And you can see that we achieve a speed up of, of 10x, a little bit more than 10x in the specialized version for our implementation on the NIC. And this is a, a fully simulated risk 5 like uh, a cycle level accurate risk 5 NIC simulation um, with a real uh, NIC simulation. So, so there's no cheating in some sense. This is not an analytic model. Um, and you could deploy it on an FPGA if you wanted. So as I mentioned, there is a, a 10x speed up for the generic implementation. There's like a 12x speed up if you do a specialized implementation to that particular data type. And comparing it to just IOVEX, which is very similar to scatter gather list, um, it's significantly faster. IOVEX only get you a 2x speed up. So I don't want to bore you to death with a lot of data. There's much more data in the paper that you can look at um, down here, uh, published at SC19. Um, or you can also watch the conference talk. It's, it's, it's on YouTube. There are many more use cases. Um, for example, we can have secure data access over the network. If you really care about a confidential compute, then this is a very nice uh, way to do this, to accelerate confidential compute as well. Um, we have network offloaded data replication. So if you care about uh, storing large data and you want to make sure that data does not, uh, is, is kind of fault tolerant, you can implement your rate implementation or erasure coding on, fully on the NIC. Um, and that is the, the last use case here, the erasure coding use case. So it's actually, uh, our implementation is actually slightly faster than TRIAC. TRIAC is a firmware change to uh, Mellanox. I apologize again, that's, it'll, it'll never happen uh, to replace this uh, of NVIDIA cards um, that, that is actually uh, production ready today. So now let me, after motivating some use cases, let me talk a little bit more about the hardware implementation. So as I mentioned, we have a full implementation and uh, that I just want to briefly describe and uh, maybe some of you are interested in this uh, to, to actually use it. So what are the design principles for in-network computation? I think one is 
uh, low latency full throughput. That's an absolutely mandatory design principle. So if you talk to any network engineer, they will tell you that's principle number one. Like you, you must not obstruct throughput. If I'm, it's pretty obvious because if I'm selling you a 400G NIC and you don't get 400G, well, then you're pretty upset as a customer. And, and then of course you want lowest latency because that's, that's an, another obvious network parameter we want to keep. Um, the second one is kind of weaker, but uh, weaker defined but the stronger and forced. In some sense, we must make sure that there is a business case for these, uh, for these smart NICs, which means we need a wide range of use cases. So the business case will only be there if the masses can use those things. So if this makes sense in my laptop, if this makes uh, sense at, at end user devices. Today, RDMA is not in most laptops. Today, RDMA is limited to the data center. I personally believe RDMA would also make sense in laptops, but the uh, unfortunately, the sockets interface that everybody's using today makes this extremely hard. The interesting twist to this is that spin could work underneath the sockets interface transparently to most applications and be worked uh, out with, um, with modern protocols like Quick that are on the rise to replace TCP. So I'm actually pretty sure that we are talking over Quick right now. Um, so, and then it should be easy to integrate in existing NIC designs, which is quite obvious because that's the cost that the vendor has to spend on, on, uh, on building it. And we made sure that it actually works with many different NIC designs. And if you're a NIC architect, you can literally just plug and play it into your NIC. And I'm going to talk about this in a couple of minutes. Um, so, but let's go to the first uh, requirement, low latency, full throughput. What does that mean? Well, in order to get full throughput, we must have a highly parallel processing system because 400G packet processing is tough. You won't do it on a single core. That's pretty clear. Um, so what you can actually look at is if you fix a certain handler duration, so a certain number of microseconds, you need to process a packet. That's what we call handler duration. So let's say we have we take four microseconds to process a single packet. We have, a, and the packet is 1.5 uh, kilobyte standard ETA uh, Ethernet, uh, frame rate or uh, frame size, MTU. And now we take four microseconds to process it. If you have a 200 gigabit per second link, it means that you need about 100 processing units that each of those takes for one packet, one, uh, four microseconds to keep the link busy. If you have a 400G link, you need nearly 200 of these processing units, right? Four microseconds is a very long time. <laughs> we will see that our design uh, can only support up to one uh, one microsecond, but of course you can scale it up. But didn't I just show you one example where we only need 52 instructions to do something useful? Yes, 52 instructions on our architecture is about 52 nanoseconds. So we have one instruction per, uh, per clock cycle and we clock at one gigahertz and we have single cycle access memory. So that's actually, you can do a whole lot as we will see in a couple of minutes. The second piece you need is fast scheduling. So you need to be able to extremely fast schedule an incoming packet onto the right processing units because you're going to have dozens, if not hundreds of processing units to keep your line rate. Now you need to schedule the stream of incoming packets that I mentioned the 0.6 nanoseconds you have per scheduling decision. Yes, to these processing units. Um, and then we must make sure that these processing units that I already mentioned here must be extremely fast which means since they're mostly pushing memory, like packet processing is a memory intensive task. You will never perform matrix multiplications on a NIC. That would be plain silly because you have a GPU for matrix multiplications. Like this makes no sense. The acceleration of network workloads is limited to data intensive tasks. So now we need to make sure that these NICs are extremely fast for data intensive tasks, which means they need very fast memory access. So our architecture supports all of those. And the second one we'll get to is the wide uh, range of use cases. And this I already motivated. Basically, we have a, a fully programmable RISC-V architecture. So it doesn't, doesn't set you any limit. It only sets your performance limits somehow. So you have a certain number of clock cycles for each packet, but you can use any RISC-V instruction. You can write your normal C code in your handler. And, and this, is, this is all fine. Many students have worked on these various projects and all of those are actually running and, and provide speed up. And like, for example, Zoo Spinner was a master's thesis. Some of those are even bachelor's thesis. So this is relatively easy to get started with this and um, develop the future of, of uh, high-speed networking. The two features we have for this um, that are uh, absolutely crucial is that we have state stateful computation in the network card itself, which means each packet handler itself can access local memory that survives uh, the packet. 
So there is per connection state that is extremely important. And then of course, there is strong isolation between the handlers um, in the sense that, that if I'm application A, I cannot access the data of application B, which is uh, quite obvious, but in the early GPUs uh, was not the case. Of course, now today it is the case, especially with, with MIG uh, support, but we go uh, as full with full isolation from the very beginning because we aim at the data center with this design and the data center is extremely uh, sensitive to um, yeah, application cross talk in some sense. Okay, so what are then the, the architectural uh, principles? As I mentioned, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the last principle is now easy to integrate. And here you see, um, oops, here you see the uh, network interface of an, uh, the, the diagram of a network interface card. You, know, you can see the host interface, the actual interface to the network. So that's kind of the transceiver here. You typically have a command unit, an outbound engine and an inbound engine. And what we add to this is simply the spin unit that sits between the inbound engine and the host interface, such that when a packet comes in, the inbound engine can either decide to send it right to the host to do the normal RDMA path or send it through the processing path through that unit. And of course that interacts with a command unit. You can also, process on the outgoing side. So if the host sends a message, it can send it through the spin unit that can then use the outbound engine and send the, the data into the network. Or the spin unit itself can react to an incoming message and create a new message to be sent to the network as well as to the host. So for example, a broadcast implementation would do that. Broadcast implementation packet would come in, would go to the spin unit. It would copy the data, send it to the host via, uh, via DMA. I will talk about this in a minute. And then uh, we would also copy the data to a new packet and then send it to the next host in line. Like for example, for um, a ring-based algorithm. Okay, so uh, we are extremely area and power efficient and we are very configurable. Well, configurable in the sense it's just a general purpose programming model uh, with, with accelerations. So how does this unit now look like? Now we are zooming into this, this P-spin unit down here. Um, this P-spin unit has of course packet memories, uh, various memories. So it has a packet buffer, it has a program memory like any CPU, and it has a code uh, memory. So, so this should probably be called data memory. That, that's more for the data. And, and these are uh, for, the, for the CPUs, um, sorry, for the code. So then it has the packet scheduler that I mentioned. That's a piece of hardware that looks at the incoming packets and assigns them to these cores. Um, in the current design, we have four clusters these are RISC-V uh, clusters from uh, PULP, the parallel ultra-low power platform from uh, Luca Benini's group, um, neighboring at ETH here. So each of these PULP clusters comes with a DMA engine, a cluster scheduler, and eight RISC-V cores, and one uh, level one um, tightly coupled data memory. Okay, so then we have DMA engines, command units, and monitoring and control units that are uh, super important, but not too interesting from a data path perspective. So remember that we have four times eight uh, course here in this cluster sitting um, as of the design of today. Um, we will see that you can actually easily double this. Um, okay, so from an application perspective, what does that mean? I already mentioned that we have these three types of handlers that you, you, you want to um, program into these devices. So here is, for example, if you want to do a filtering example, let's use the second one. Um, you have a header handler, a, pay, a payload handler, as well as a, a, a completion handler. And you define them at the at the programmer level at the at the user space. Um, then you define an execution context. What is an execution context? An execution context is really uh, these three handlers together with some initial state. That that is, uh, if if you want to go with the CUDA analogy, that is the state that you would CUDA mem copy into your device and the host buffer, which is the shared memory between you and the NIC. And if you wanted to go by RDMA analogy, that would be, be your, your, uh, your completion queue where you have posted these buffers, um, no, not the completion queue, but the receive queue where you have posted these buffers for consumption by the NIC. So then, um, yeah, this is, this is just the, the animation. The state lives in the handler memory, the program lives in the program memory, uh, the buffer lives at the host side, and then, the last thing you need to do is you need to define a matching rule such that the inbound engine knows which packet that is coming in needs to either go right into the host or goes the processing path and also which handler to invoke for that particular packet. So that you, that's usually based on the connection. Um, if you have a certain processing connection established, all packets for that connection will then go through the p-spin unit and this is pretty much transparent. So from a networking perspective, what happens is, as I just mentioned, the packets coming in, the, the first thing that happens is they're matched to the execution context. If there is no execution context, they will behave like a normal RDMA packet, like your standard NIC. 
Um, if there is an execution context, I'm writing, or the, the NIC itself writes the packet into the level two uh, packet buffer over here, and then invokes um, the scheduler, the packet scheduler. The packet scheduler then looks at, at uh, the, the availability of clusters and, um, uh, and, and uh, cores on the cluster. It sends the packet to uh, the request to a particular cluster, in this case, cluster one. Cluster one then schedules it locally, um, and runs it here in this case on core number two. And uh, the packet is then copied into the level one buffer, uh, into the level one memory uh, TCDM in cluster one. Okay, so the whole thing, the, the whole scheduling from incoming packet to accessible in level one memory takes for small packets 12 nanoseconds, and that is a cycle level simulation, and for one kilobyte packets 26 nanoseconds. So this is extremely fast. Um, we tuned that a lot because that is in your critical path. Like every single packet that is going through the processing path is affected by this latency. But we got it down to a single digit nanoseconds. Now what about the bandwidth? The bandwidth is, uh, is enough to support 400G at, at full bandwidth <laughs> in 50 gigabytes per second. So I don't want to go into too many details, but what's happening on the, if a packet is coming in or a train of packet comes in, it's deposited into this packet memory, as I mentioned, and then copied to level one. And that is possible at full bandwidth. Um, once the processing is finished at these clusters, again, at full bandwidth, all these four clusters can copy the data either to the outbound engine to be sent uh, through the transceiver into the network or through the DMA um, into the host memory, uh, also at full bandwidth through DMA and IOMMU and all of these things. Um, you can also send the packet directly from packet memory. So if you want to save energy, um, for some packets, you may not want to look through the whole payload, but only through the headers. That is one way to configure the engine in a way that the packet is simply deposited into packet memory, uh, which is your incoming NIC memory in some sense here. It's, it's a shared input buffer and then forwarded right to the host without going through the cluster. Of course, then if it's not going through the cluster, you can only change the headers of the packet and the um, you could, for example, do receive site scaling, uh, intelligent receive site scaling at the, at the cluster level, but you cannot change the contents of the packet, obviously, because they're just copied. Um, so you can implement some form of intelligent DMA um, at, at lower cost. Um, so again, this is 400G input output, uh, the, the architecture supports it. So just to, to talk a little bit about the design, um, we synthesized the design in 22 nanometers FDSOI um, global foundries uh, process uh, to, with a target clock rate of one gigahertz. The area is with 95 million gate equivalents at about 18.5 square millimeter at a 70% layout density. The power consumption is 7.1 watt, but this is the absolute worst case. Um, so we are assuming that every single gate triggers at every single clock cycle. So we are expecting something more like uh, two watts, but uh, it's, it's hard to determine in, in a real simulation. So this is why we reported the absolute worst case. Um, the um, decomposition of the chip is quite interesting. Um, as you can see here, it's mostly memory. So, so this is the share of the chip space. And you can see the L2 memory is already 60%. <laughs> And then these cores are 40%. So each of those cores is about 10% of the chip area. But then each core has about 85%, no, actually 90% memory again. So the, the chip is essentially 90% uh, memory SRAM. Um, the L1 SRAM is single cycle accessible. The L2 SRAM needs a handful of cycles to get to. So there are different uh, efficiency SRAMs. If you compare this to a blue field, architecture, which has 16 A72, 64 bit cores. The estimated area of these cores is 51 square millimeter. So we could fit two and a half of our uh, processing um, blocks in the same area. And th that would be on path. Right? The current Bluefield generation is an off path, Nick. Um, okay. So um, yeah, let me just let me just skip that piece in the interest of time here. So just to uh, to, to summarize uh, the architecture, we have a highly parallel architecture, fast scheduling, fast explicit memory access with single cycle level one uh, memory access. We have stateful computation support. Um, we have um, like full risk five uh, support, which is in some sense very much the same as, as the ARM support that, um, uh, that that other vendors have. It's just that it's the open source alternative to ARM that everybody can use uh, free of charge. And then we have an area of and power efficient design, 18 square millimeter, 6.1 watts. We have a configurable number of clusters and cores per cluster because we just use Pulp, and Pulp is a wonderful framework for doing these kinds of things. So now to um, to come uh, to experimental results. 
we could actually now, uh, well, we, we want to look a little bit at what does this really mean? Um, how do we characterize various processing tasks on the NIC? So we have three different classes of processing tasks. So one is packet steering. As I mentioned, receive side scaling or smart receive side scaling would be one example. We have filtering and data types where we do not change the data. We do not really touch the data. Then we have data movement, which is also not really touching the data, but much more complex than just packet steering. For example, here it would be a key value store where we have to look up the right target location for the keys um, or for the, for the values to be deposited into. Um, so imagine just memcached fully offloaded to the network. And then we can do full packet processing in the NIC where we now do aggregation of the payload data, histogramming of the payload data, or even reduction of the payload data, which is very important in machine learning workloads. So we, we all do this on this architecture. Um, here is the result somehow for these different workloads. So aggregate, filtering, histogram, key values, or reduced uh, data types. This is all implemented, by the way. You can download all of these uh, kernels and handlers. Um, there is the uh, ISCA 21 uh, paper and that has a full reproducibility package if you want to run this all yourself. And I will have a link in a couple of slides. Um, so now the interesting observation is, or and the obvious observation is that the larger the packets, of course, the higher the bandwidth we get because the scheduling overhead goes down, right? So if, if I'm running at, uh, at 200 gigabit per second with very, very small packets and I'm getting a lot of packets and my scheduling overhead will be the bottleneck. So here we see... Um, 64 byte packets in the first bar for each of those, 512 byte packets in the second bar, and one kilobyte packets in the last bar. You can see 64 byte packets are okay ish for some, not great uh, for others, like this key value store, for example. Um, of course, the key value store is a particularly bad example because you need to figure out where your data goes and then you just trigger the copy. So the larger, the, the figuring out where it goes is a constant overhead and the larger the packet, uh, the more of your bandwidth it's consuming and thus the more bandwidth you actually get at the end. Um, so, but what we can see is for um, pretty much all of the workloads or most of the workloads uh, with one kilobyte packets, we saturate 400 gigabit per second um, in, in throughput. And now you could also look at the um, at another view of this, uh, this, this plot that I, meant, that I had before. So here we have again 200 gigabit per second and 400 gigabit per second lines. And here are the maximum handler time. So this is the number of cycles or number of instructions you need in order to process your packet. And now you can see for our particular architecture with those uh, four times eight cores, eight cores in, in four clusters, um, in order to get uh, 1,000 instructions per packet, we need at least 700, um, about 700 uh, bytes per packet. And in the extreme case, if you have 200G um, with 1K packets, we can afford, you can also read this from the left, about 1,000, let's say 1,400 um, nanoseconds, which equals to 1,400 instructions. So as you can see, I'm already counting instructions here for you. Um, that is exactly what you do in network packet processing. You're always counting instructions because you have this very stringent budget um, where you can only afford so many instructions per packet. Otherwise, you're not going to run at line rate, which is also not bad. I mean, if you consume more instructions per packet, the only thing that will happen is you will back pressure your link um, as if, you're, uh, if you would just not be able to consume all the packets, which of course in, in today's InfiniBand and Rocky implementations is a problem if you start back pressuring your link, but it's a completely different discussion that I, I don't want to get into. We can do this in the question session if anybody's really interested. Um, so now let's compare our architecture to three different, uh, sorry, to two other architectures. Um, one is a Xeon based Imagine we would be building a Xeon-based SmartNIC. And another one is imagine we would be building an ARM Cortex-A53 based SmartNIC, kind of similar to the, um, uh, to, to, the, to the blue field. So as we see here for these different tasks that we are doing, the aggregation filtering, again, these are the same as I had before. And the gigabit per second is now the theoretically possible processing bandwidth of each of those cores when just running our, um, our workloads. So, the left one is the, the Intel CPU. The middle one, uh, the red one is the Intel CPU. The green one is the um, ARM CPU. And the blue one is the uh, RISC-V based uh, uh, processing block. I don't want to call it CPU that, that we have, um, that, that we've just talked about. You can see that per core throughput is of course widely dominated by the Intel CPU. It's an extremely powerful CPU. 
Um, well, the uh, Risk Five and the ARM CPUs, the A53, are about equivalent. So, right? so the Risk Five is a little bit faster, but but not everywhere, and and not by much. But now, if you look at the actual area of those CPUs, well, the Intel CPU is also an extremely large uh, per core CPU, and thus uh, th that's where the processing power comes from. And now, if we normalize the per core throughput by the area of the CPU, which for the Intel CPU is, is nearly, 60, uh, nearly 36 square millimeters, while the ARM CPU is only 1.7 and our design is only 0 0.6. And this is per core right, so for, for each of the cores. And now if we normalize the per core throughput per area, we see a different picture. So we see that the, the RISC-V based uh, tiny implementation wins in pretty much all configurations um, closely followed by the CPU, uh, by, by the Intel CPU in some cases, but in other cases closely followed by the ARM CPU. So if you want to know more about this architecture and implementation, um, you can look at the ISCA paper. The link is down here. Here's a screenshot of the, of the paper. I want to thank all my uh, co-authors in this. This was a great uh, interdisciplinary uh, project with silicon designers and, and uh, my, my group. We are more on the, on the architecture side. Okay, so now I want to just give you a brief overview of in, in a couple of minutes of what you can do for in-network reduction. So how do you move this idea from the smart NIC into the, uh, a smart switch in some sense? The idea is exactly the same. So you still offload your kernels into the network. You execute um, these, these, uh, these handlers in, in, the, in, in the inbound engine at each switch now. Um, but now you can merge multiple different switch ports and you have to have logic to actually route it inside the switch. Um, the, the motivation is really that you can reduce the required network bandwidth for all reduce by a factor of two if you offload the operation into the network. Right? So the idea is for, for an all reduce is somehow you, you have um, every, every node, in this case H0, H1, H2, H3, has a, a certain data item. And what you want to do is you want that all of these nodes have all of the, the sum or, or some associated function of those data items together uh, received. So for example, this is a one, a two, and a three. Um, I want that at the end of the operation, each of the nodes has a one plus two plus three. So that being six. Um, and, and of course, um, the way you do this is you send the data through this little network here. So this is a fat tree network of two, <laughs> uh, of, of height two. Um, and so you would send it up. And then you would be adding uh, the, the, the data uh, in the switch, for example. So you hear these, these two, these little star and this, this other shape, uh, this rhombic shape um, is added up and then sent to the next switch level. And then once the, the top level switch has um, added all these values together, it's sent back. Um, if we would not have the functionality in the switch, what we would need to do is we would need to essentially exchange all that data with all endpoints and then the endpoints added. That is the reason why we have a two times bandwidth overhead, oh, not overhead, but why we can save uh, two times bandwidth if we do it in the network, in, in the switch. Um, the state of the art is, um, I mean, uh, not going into too much detail, but um, the, the, the state of the art is that we cannot do uh, fully programmable today, we can do certain, uh, well, let me summarize it still. <laughs> we, we can uh, do certain functions, um, but we, for example, usually do not support custom operators and types in the switch. We usually don't support unstructured and sparse data. And then a determinism or reproducibility is partially supported by some solutions. Um, if you do it the spin-based way, you would be able to support all of those three requirements um, seamlessly on pretty much uh, any architecture. Of course, it comes at a cost, right? So I'm not saying uh, that this is cheap. The current implementations are extremely optimized and, and extremely cheap. Um, so the idea is very much the same. We have switch ports, we have the parser. It looks very much the same like the NIC. The incoming path goes through the processing unit. Then there are, of course, routing tables and crossbars uh, that, that then on the, on the egress path, we also go through the processing unit again. Um, if you're familiar with a P4-based switch design, it's very much the same. I mean, this would be the P4 processing unit, but now here, we, this is the P-spin processing unit. We are assuming the same design um, of our four clusters with eight cores each, the standard P-spin unit. Um, so just in the interest of time, because I would like to answer some questions at the end, I will now uh, skip a couple of slides. Well, I hope there are questions, but then, um, if you look at the uh, at cycle accurate simulations, I mean, I, I just skipped the, the details of how we implemented it. You can read it in the paper. It's, it's down here, uh, published at the supercomputing last year. Um, 
we compare it to the Sharp implementation, which is the fastest on market um, implementation today, where we can achieve in, in a switch a little bit more than 3.2 uh, terabit per second. That, that was published a couple of years ago. Maybe that changed by now. There was a paper by, at that time, Mellanox. Um, then there is a, a second competitor, which is SwitchML. So SwitchML uses a P4-based switch design that are implementing, um, implementing integer reduction in the P4 language um, because P4 does today not support floating point reductions. Sharp does support floating point reductions, of course. Um, and then we are looking at the the results uh, of, of our uh, various design options for uh, what we call flare, flexible in-network or reductions. And um, if you just look at the largest one, we are uh, competitive with the Sharp design. We don't manage to largely outperform it because it's actually extremely hard. So Sharp is really nice, um, but we are more flexible. So, so we can support sparse data. We can support arbitrary um, uh, data types, essentially, as they're supported by the RISC-V implementation, for example, here in 32, in 16, in 8, and float. Um, um, but, but actually, those may all may be supported by, uh, by Sharp as well. But we could also do complex, for example. So um, then the, uh, it's a real example is a ResNet training, a ResNet 50 training example, where we assume that the gradients are 99.8% sparse. And there you see it, it shines uh, very much. If you do the host-based implementation, um, that would be uh, about 16 or 17 milliseconds uh, per iteration. Um, if we run the uh, flare implementation, then this halves the time for the dense case, because as I mentioned, uh, you get a 2x uh, bandwidth reduction. This is, it translates directly into a 2x speed up. This would be uh, very much the same that you would get on Sharp. And then you can get another 40% um, speed up, I would say here, um, if, we, uh, if we do sparse processing. And now the interesting thing is it's 99.8% sparse. Why don't we get uh, 50x speed up? Well, because sparse processing is super expensive. And this is something that is really bound by the microarchitecture in the NIC, um, so, such that uh, we could consider other devices um, that, that could be faster. But yeah, with that, I would like to, to finish my presentation and hopefully motivate you to ask some questions. Um, the, the whole design, everything is available on, uh, on GitHub, uh, SPCL pspin. You find the full RTL code. You can print your own chips with it. You find the runtime implementation and lots of example codes together with an SST in the very later a simulation environment if you're an academic and cannot necessarily print your own chips. So with that, I would like to close my talk. And um, yeah, if you want to join the team, <laughs> we have always open positions down here in SPCL uh, jobs. But yeah, let me know. And, Thanks for your um, thanks for your questions that are hopefully going to come. Thank you, Torsten. I really appreciate the, your opening keynote. Uh, as we wait for questions, and just a reminder, folks can ans uh, ask questions via the Q and A window at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'd like to pass it over to Hussein. I'm sure Hussein has a couple of thoughts on his end. Uh, well, uh, hi, hi, Torsten. It's really great talk. I really enjoyed it. You know, and some of the points maybe I still have to digest it. Uh, so I already downloaded your the paper and I will be looking at them. So um, uh, following up a little bit, I was I was wondering about the short user defined functions. I mean, this is um, uh, uh, maybe maybe we need to elaborate a little bit on it. So what the user needs to to understand and to do in to be able to to have control of these these um, uh, you know these these functions to avoid being too much or or little. I mean, how that could be from a practical point of view. To make it clear for every for everybody in a, in a simple way. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the simplest example is what what uh, let's say Sharp supports today. So Sharp gives you a very uh, specific programming interface where you say, well, I want to reduce um, that vector, and and it's, it's it's essentially what it does. And so you tell it, I have so many numbers, I have uh, I don't know, of that type, and I'm going to send them through your switch, and uh, then you give me the sum of those. That's one way of specifying it. So so that in, in our language would be. Uh, maybe a handful of instructions, maybe five or so, because you still need to load the data and whatnot. And so you would write a very little program that would just say A plus B. That, that, that would that would what Sharp would be doing. You, you would get as, as input parameters, you would get array A and array B, and you say return A plus B. That's your C code. Um, and then, of course, you can write arbitrarily complex programs. So I didn't show any source code, um, but you can, I mean, some source codes are multiple hundreds of lines in C. Um, but they still usually the critical path is less than a thousand instructions because you cannot, uh, well, you cannot have more. <laughs> that, that's just uh, the trade-off. 
Yeah, so that, that will take me to the second question, which is related to the existing application and benefits from it. So that means that required and re-importing the code or rewriting the code to be able to handle this because it will be difficult mm -hmm. for codes that they are not prepared for it. And of that course. will make things so complicated. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's exactly the same as, as if you wanted to use uh, use Stripes. <laughs> Sorry for bringing up always the same. Um, I mean, Stripe you can use in two ways. You can use it directly from your application or you can just download an MPI implementation that is kind of sharp enabled. Um, and then you will magically just benefit from, this, from the speed up. And, and the same you could do here. I mean, your MPI implementation could be using these network acceleration features. So for example, uh, fast data types, and um, you could just use that MPI implementation. So you could either have a library implementation where somebody else optimized your code for you, like, like DK Panda uh, probably would, uh, has, has been doing this for Sharp. And, or you can just do it yourself. It, it, it really depends. And I see both use cases. I see very application-specific use cases where users are writing their own kernels, very much like you. Very, some users write CUDA kernels today because they're very specific. But then I see library-based use cases where users don't even really know that they are using that uh, a feature. Um, for example, very similar to CUDA today, if I'm using PyTorch, I literally just say, oh, uh, use GPU, and, and then boom, you use the GPU and you don't even realize that you're using it. So that's a library-based approach. I think both approaches are valuable, very much like CUDA. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, offloading have been, have been always, I mean, GPU Direct have been yeah. working, doing a lot of, of such. <laughs> exactly, same of thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I can see similarities here. Yes. But definitely, yes, that's, that's, that's really a good, a good start where, need to push more people to be able to make that enabled in their codes and exactly. which will make it benefit for the community because, you know, having it there and instead of writing it. So maybe we have to push Decay and tell them, well, yeah, it's just there, <laughs> try something. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, have, we have to push some vendors to, to first get there, but, but I'm hearing that, that pretty much every single networking vendor goes into this direction these days. So, so this will show up in some form or another. It may not be exactly the same, but I'm very positive that we will have general generally programmable NICs in the very near future. So my last thing with many industry, yeah. with many vendors to make this happen. Yeah, so. yeah. which, which is, yeah, makes a lot of, so. so my last point is regarding eight, why HPU? I mean, uh, is, is this the Microsoft um, uh, virtual, um, what's, I don't know what, what's called Holland's. I mean, it's in, in, in these interfaces. Is, is it really? Why did we call it header, a handler processing unit? Yeah, is it is it at least related to any kind of hardware, or this should be specific to be HPU? No, no, no. The, the, okay. the name is pretty much random. I would oh, okay. say, and okay. I always mix it up with handler processing yeah. unit. Yeah, exactly. That's why I, I went there to that direction. But that not it's a bad naming, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but no, now fine. we have it in papers. It's going to be hard to change. Um, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. No, it's just the name is okay. Okay, thank you. No. Oh, thank you, Hussein. I currently, oh, I do actually have a question that just came in. Um, let's see. All right, Tarsen, do you see SBIN uh, on similar architecture used for both compute and data intensive workloads, e.g. like neural network training on very large data sets directly over the network? Um, that, is, that is a very good question. So, so what I'm seeing is somewhat convergence. I, I don't think that the that the, like the second part of the question is, i.e. tensor cores on a NIC. Um, I don't think it makes too much sense to have tensor cores on a NIC, but what we may want to uh, consider is uh, main CPU less accelerators. So we have accelerators that are directly orchestrated from the NIC. So, so you wouldn't have a main CPU. You would literally just have an, an accelerated NIC and then accelerated com compute block. Or you have an accelerated NIC, an accelerated compute block, and an accelerated uh, latency compute block, which is like the, um, some architectures that are uh, coming forward relatively soon. Um, so, so we will see. I, I think this is complementary. I would not say that the NIC should contain cores that would be on other uh, units. So the, the NIC should be an addition, the smart NIC should be an addition to the system, um, making it, uh, increasing its efficiency. Great. Thank you, Torsten. Really appreciate the keynote. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I if I may too, you know the the problem is that is that uh, Usain and, and myself are very competitive, right? So whenever whatever he does, I need to do one more, and then when I do one more, he needs to do one more on top of that. <laughs> so so Usain says, you know, download download one paper. Actually, there are three relevant papers Usain you can download, right? So you're kind of you're missing two. Um, I have uh, seen them, but I get one only that I am looking for. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so, so just just a couple of, of notes and uh, and potentially proposal, and I'm 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 trying to um, stay neutral, kind of um, as much as I can. To, uh, the the first, it's it's good to see that the the old uh, old arguments between onload and offload on the network it's yes, yes. going going in in one direction and 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 folks more and more realize that actually offload is yep. an important thing to do absolutely that's that's one thing uh year, years of arguments right that uh, come to a conclusion um uh, packet processing essentially is is something that existed for many many years right so quadrix mm -hmm. for example had a processor yep. instead of the nick uh, P4, it's one kind of processor, and there is other kind of processors. It's always uh, good to have something like that because you can actually bring extra functionality and test it. Mm -hmm. um, typically, when you start hitting uh, high speeds of networks and massive message rate and so forth, you actually need to do the full processing in hardware, and that's yeah. actually what you do hardly in and so forth. Right? If you stop in a embedded processor, you, you are not able to to double the message rate and speeds and so forth. Um, that I'm uh, not sure of. That, that 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 I'm contesting. If you have a very small number of instructions, you can actually do it. Yeah, but, but not that, much. Yeah, but it depends on how many uh, DMA engines you want to support mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. size of the ASIC and yeah. how many users Expensive. are running on top of the system and so forth. Right. Um, now the the uh, the switch side or, or sharp. Uh, you're right. This, this is this is also done uh, essentially in hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is mechanism for small message reduction and large message reduction, which behave a little bit different in that sense. And you want to keep lowest latency for the small message reduction and, of Absolutely. course, be able to meet the balance for the large message reduction. And uh, now, actually, the reductions are running at 400 gigabit per second speed at a 64 port radix. So, actually, mm -hmm. you're able to increase and, and double the sharp performance from generation to generation, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. Um, now, now, one thing, one thing you mentioned, and and this is kind of a point, uh, might be of a, of a, a mutual interest. Um, the the DPU devices obviously include include ARM cores, right? So this mm -hmm. is a stronger processor than RISC V, and there is more memory, so you can do more complicated operations on top of that. But those devices also include data processing or not data data processing and accelerator. It's called DPA. Mm -hmm. it's essentially, it's consisted uh, of multiple RISC-V cores yep. uh, and an MMU within the device. So that actually, if you have code, for example, that can actually be explored running on existing DPUs on that uh, DPA accelerator. Uh, so that, that's something that uh, is, is programmable, right? It's yep. programmable, so actually you can bring those elements into that and explore with the DPUs actually having that inside. Mm -hmm. So that's actually combining them both. So uh, definitely an interesting, interesting uh, presentation. And thank you very much for that. Uh, and if there is an interest to look into utilizing risk of cores and existing uh, DP, uh, DPUs, for example, that will be uh, uh, something I think interesting to explore. Oh, that, that's what we want to do. I mean, we are trying to get our hands on on the, the devices you mentioned and, and Jose knows this <laughs> best. So, so yes, we, we would love to run these things. I mean, at the end, we are, we are not fighting the hardware war. We would like to engage with vendors right. to help vendors to push the interface. Like, like we, we want to help you guys and we would love to engage. So so this, this P-spin is, is really just a... Um, a reference implementation for academics. I, I don't think that anybody will. Well, actually, no. There are there is interest in, in printing it from from pretty powerful vendors, um, but but we will see if that happens. Yeah, I'd I I love to engage. Yeah, yeah completely agree. And and I'll, I'll contact you. You know, outside of this scope, but uh, it's not it's not the there is no competition. By the way, I don't see any competition. Yeah, it's exactly. great actually to see development that actually helps to bring more things, more capabilities. Mm -hmm. Definitely a great thing to see. Excellent. So, Torsen, that your talk, I mean, helped me a lot actually in, 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 in describing and motivating the stuff. So that's perfect. Thank you. And that's that will make our road easier. Yeah. yeah excellent. You see, he, he needed to add another you know sentence after I finished, right? That's, that's how <laughs> yeah. Very true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Torsten. Appreciate that. Appreciate that.